There she is. How you doing? I can't hear you. I don't know why. Do you have uh, headphones with a microphone? We can't hear MJ. I can hear Jason though. Hi, hi. Hi, how are you? Great. I would just, uh, when you when you share your screen, mm -hmm. you move it over. You just wanna share the application window for your PowerPoint. You don't want to share your whole screen because it does this fractal effect, just so you know. So we can't hear MJ. So do you do you have headphones around Mary Jane somewhere? Like old Apple headphones work. You don't have a mic. Your microphone's not on in your computer and you might be able to just get it to turn on uh, with the settings for your computer. And if you, if you call Amy on your cell phone, she might be able to talk you through how to do that as well. She's our amazing tech support today. And her email or her uh, cell phone number is in the top of the email appointment for today with all the links in it. I can, uh, Jen, can I try sharing my screen just to see that that absolutely. works? Absolutely. Go ahead. And we want the application window, you said? Application window, yeah. Lovely. Okay. Looks good. Welcome back, everybody. We're just, we're just queuing up. So in the interest of the schedule, um, what we could do is maybe uh, we could start could start with Dr. DeVoe if, uh, if that's okay with him. Hey, I'm ready to roll. Yeah? Okay. I've got this nice yellow haze on my screen. I don't know why, but uh, okay. Oh, it doesn't look like that from here. No, it looks weirdly, ah, it's better now. I forgot my little spotlight. There you go. Okay, I will share my screen then if you're ready for me to do that. For sure. And okay. then Mary Jane, I'm just gonna turn your video off for you. Okay, wonderful. So let me just introduce you, Jason, and then uh, you'll get going and you have about, just like about 30 minutes, 29 minutes. You're welcome to take a little less. Uh, there'll be a question and answer period at the end. So welcome back, everybody. I have most of you back online here. So I'll, I'll get started. So we're, we're going to switch up the program a little bit. We had an audio difficulty with our first speaker. So we're going to start with Jason. Jason DeVoe is our first speaker of this session, session two. Jason is the application technology specialist with OMAFRA out of Simcoe uh, since 2008, which I can't believe it's been that long. Tell That's me about great. it. I know. Uh, Jason studied plant physiology, holds a PhD from the University of Guelph, which is actually where I met Jason. Uh, he researches and develops practical methods to optimize productivity, spray effectiveness, and reduce waste. He's co-author of Air Blast 101, your guide to effective and efficient spraying. He also co-administers sprayers101.com, the website. Welcome, Jason. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So uh, full disclosure, everybody, uh, this is going to be a 30 minute infomercial. What do you think of that? No, not really. Uh, what I want to do is introduce you to a resource that I've recently developed with a couple of colleagues. And I, I think the idea behind this whole thing is uh, that old proverb, I could give you a fish, but you know, you come back to me for another fish tomorrow. So I much prefer to teach you how to fish. And this book, I hope, will become uh, a powerful tool in your arsenal of crop protection. Um, 
Some of you may already be familiar with the Airblast 101 title, but before you uh, drift away to a cup of coffee, I want to assure you that this is like the first copy as I was to me 12 years ago. This is a completely different book, and I actually toyed with changing the title. It's so different. So let's dig in. Just a smidge of history for those who aren't in the know. A couple of years after I started, thank you, Jen, uh, in 2010, I developed a classroom-based workshop for air blast sprayer operators. And when I started this job, there seemed to be field sprayer information everywhere. You pitch a rock, you're going to hit somebody with an opinion. But air blast sprayers are so diverse and so intrinsically complicated that they just never seem to have a champion. And as a result, uh, depending on where you went in Ontario or, in fact, the world, there was always somebody that felt they were a pro and they worked to become a, a, another fish metaphor, another big fish in a small pond. So in exposing myself to all those different ideas, I got to really see what I thought best practices might become. So I, I built this workshop course and it grew and it grew, but I couldn't be everywhere. So um, in 2015, I decided to take all that information and jam it into a book. And it did really well. I wrote it for Ontario. I wrote it for our growers. I wrote it for our cropping systems and our reality. And over the years, about a thousand of these printed books were distributed worldwide. And I got to tell you, that surprised me because it wasn't for the world. We use sprayers that they don't and vice versa. Uh, they have techniques and approaches and protocols that they use that we don't. And that kind of tickled the back of my head. And I thought, why? Why don't we take this back to grassroots and try again? And this time, why don't I glean best practices the world over? Why restrict us to the things that we do every day when we can look to see how other people are perhaps doing it better and learn from them? So this new book was the result of me being trapped in my kitchen for 14 months. I figured, what a miserable situation. How do I create something lasting and powerful and good out of a crappy situation? and it was to rewrite this book. This is now quite a bit larger, and it delves into the physics of spraying. It describes new equipment and explores those international best practices. Now, before that becomes a, a break for you and you go, physics, that's what I want to read, a 300-page book on physics. Let me assure you, we wrote this to be very comprehensive. As air sprayer design continues to change and evolve, we have changed and evolved with it and broadened the scope. So you're going to read about air assist designs and techniques and cropping systems that maybe you haven't encountered before. And you'll find relevance to how what others are doing relates to what you're doing. Um, and, you know, like I said, maybe I want to read or write a 300 page book on physics, but that's not everybody. So we've worked very hard to make it accessible. And I don't mean that to be condescending. I mean, we wanted to spoon feed some physics to you so that you could understand how important it was to, to engage it in your spraying operation. So we've kept it all conversational, and I'm, I challenge you to find more than half a dozen pages in the whole book where there isn't an illustration or a figure or something to underpin a lesson. Uh, we've even tried to make it fun. You'll have to forgive me my humor, but there are hosts and hostesses for this book. This is Turbulent Eddie and Laminar Flow. And if you don't get that gag, then you really do need to dig into physics. Uh, their core concepts of how air moves. And these two characters will lead a reader from A to Z all the way through the book in these concepts in a way that we hope is fun and engaging. I did mention we. Um, I did the best I could with the first book, but I needed help with Jay, I think we lost your audio. Jason, can you hear me? Hmm. Yeah, can you hear me? I can't hear you. Can you speak? 
Oh, your your audio just jumped off like 30 seconds ago. Yeah, it's still gone. Can't hear you. Weird. <laughs> Yay. Oh, great. Yeah, audio drop for everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might have to uh you might have to jump out and jump back in. Would you mind doing that? Okay. Oh, that's too bad. That's okay. We've got some extra time in this slot. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> That's a nice compliment. Yes. Hmm. He'll, uh, he'll be back in. Hey, and this gives me, gives me a chance to say Landscape Ontario has a economic outlook event next Wednesday at one o'clock. Check out their website. I, I sent a bunch of you uh, a, the link for the registration last night, um, probably around six o'clock. So check your email for those of you that are on my distribution list. But yeah, it's really, really neat. They've got um, someone from RBC Canada and uh, some great speakers lined up to talk about, you know, the outlook for, for the industry. So do check that out. And I'll, I can send that out again uh, after today's event. <clears throat> yeah, I agree. A few little hiccups aren't too bad. Oh, and the link is in the chat. So Amy just put the link for that economic forecast webinar in the chat. So check yeah. that out. Oh, there you are. Yay. Okay. No worries. We're a very understanding, lovely group of people. Well, in my defense, all I did was say great things and my microphone <laughs> couldn't stand it. So let's get the screen share back on. Hmm. That's not the right one. Ah, that's the right one. There are we, go. we we're seeing goodness? Yes, we are. Well, I'm for the sake of time, I'm gonna boogie on. Uh, in short, collaborative means it's not just the Jason show. I went to two guys that have 35, 40, 50 years of research, brilliant men, both of them, and the three of us worked from our kitchens to write this book. So here's what you're gonna find in it. You're gonna learn these three core concepts. You're gonna learn about the forces that influence air and spray droplet behavior. If you don't understand how air and spray work, you'll have no luck getting it where it's going. You're gonna to learn to configure any air as a sprayer design to get, to, get, to get better coverage and to minimize waste, which I think we can all agree are uh, objectives that we should all aspire to. And you're gonna to learn to evaluate the job you're doing without feedback, you're guessing, and that's no good. So. This collage would be a great reason why I still have a job. I would love to be able to walk out and tell you, do these five things and you're golden, but look at the diversity. This is also why it was so hard to find people that knew what they were talking about on this subject. I could give you advice for one of these very different sprayer designs in say a container crop, and it would be completely wrong if you were using a different sprayer, or if perhaps you were using the same sprayer spraying whips. So physics was really the only common denominator. We had to explain how everything worked so that you could use that information to apply to your situation. And I, I think we've, we did some pretty revolutionary stuff in treating it that way. So I'm just going to touch on a little bit of the content in each of the chapters. And then uh, like the good showman I am, I'll finally reveal where you can get it. Chapter one is foundational information. Um, this is all the things that a sprayer operator has to think about to do a good job. And it's, it'll make you throw up in the back of your mouth a little bit. It is an intimidating pile of information. And not only understanding how each of these affect what you're doing, but how each of them affect one another. That's the real uh, mind blower is that you could make a change for the better in one regard 
and then mess something up entirely and unintentionally. But we work to explain every one of these factors and give you a better understanding of how they work together. In chapter two, I confess we were three months into writing this book when I had to stop everybody and I said, you know what? We're all using different words for the same thing. There is no standardized language for air blast spraying. You're, to try, you're trying to describe geometry and three-dimensional physics with words that we all just kind of make up. If I'm honest, there are no standards. So we develop standards because how can you teach and advance something until you're using the same language? So we introduce foundational concepts like the inverse square law, and we introduce that standardized vocabulary. And I've got to say, if there's one overriding principle in the whole book, it's the inverse square law. And it works like this. You have a lot of spray and a lot of air energy next to the sprayer. The further away you get, the less of either you have. And it's not linear. If you go twice as far, you don't have half the spray or half the air energy. It's exponential. So understanding how quickly that drops off teaches you to have a little more confidence in what your sprayer can do and what it can't. First and foremost, really, when we dip into things, it's air behavior. Uh, without air, you just have a sprayer, and that's why we call it air blast. You need the air. You can't get a droplet to go where it's going unless it has some force to get it there. That's the air. So we explain the principle of what you're trying to achieve, why you want to displace stagnant air in a canopy with air that's full of droplets. And we describe all the elements of what makes air work. Um, what turbulence is, what laminarity is, why you should use a certain kind of air and not another kind of air to achieve a certain goal. And then we dip into the sprayers. You saw the collage. There are a phenomenal number of sprayer designs. So how do we describe them in a way that someone starts reading and says, ah, this isn't me. This doesn't apply to me. I don't need to read anymore. Well, we've got to boil them down to their component parts. So we've invented a way to categorize sprayers by the direction of air they create. And believe it or not, this is a really intuitive way to describe what different designs are capable of doing. Then we get into the liquid handling systems. And perhaps I should have mentioned in defining sprayers, we do break them down to the three things that all sprayers have. They have air, they have liquid, and they have nozzles. So that's how we define them. This happens to be every bloody bell and whistle that we could figure exists on an air assist sprayer. Uh, odds are you may go your whole career and only see half of these, but that doesn't mean you should be limited by that. There are a lot of phenomenal features available uh, aftermarket to put on a sprayer that'll make your lives easier, that'll make sprayer clean out easier, that'll make your level of safety as an operator better. And just because you don't happen to have it now doesn't mean you can't consider it. We, so we describe all the different anatomical plumbing parts of a sprayer as I say, including some maybe you've never considered. And then finally, uh, in defining sprayers, atomization. It's so easy to say nozzles, but that's actually a pretty small-minded thing to say, I have discovered. We've got a lot more than just nozzles on air blast sprayers. We've got twin fluid systems like the picture in the middle. We have rotary atomizers like that spinning wheel, which is the equivalent of hitting a droplet with a tennis racket. It makes phenomenally fine droplets. And that leads us into a discussion of droplet sizes. We've all been inundated with field sprayer information and it's not correct for our world. Uh, our sprayers, the largest droplet they might be able to produce is medium. And honestly, that's one of the smallest droplets that a field sprayer would ever consider using. So everything they say not to do in field sprayer know-how is where we begin. And uh, you know, we wanna break down that mythos and explain to you why a tiny droplet is not the enemy. It doesn't instantly mean drift or evaporation. It just means you have a greater potential for coverage as long as your air is correct. And I'm, I'm hoping to break people of that uh, falsehood and teach them why that's the case. Chapter seven is canopy. Um, it's completely wrong for someone to give you sprayer advice without asking you what it is you're actually spraying. Uh, canopy management, the shape, the size, the density, goes together with sprayer uh, alignment like interlaced fingers. You, you just can't change one without considering the other. 
So this chapter talks all about different canopy features, anatomical features, uh, physiological things that you may want to look at as you're deciding um, how to arrange your spray or to spray it, and why we describe a canopy as a kind of moving target. As the season goes on, depending if you're spraying an evergreen or, or some kind of perennial, it may change. It may not be the same beastie you adjusted your sprayer for. So, you know, we inform you about that and, and what to look for and what to do about it. Chapter eight is spraying strategy. Um, some of you, I hope, will recognize water sensitive paper on the left. If you forget everything about this talk, I hope the two things you remember is where to get the book and to go buy a water sensitive paper. And we also talk about why uh, your work rate, how fast you get the job done, is really only part of the productivity of an operation. Because what's the point of rushing through it if you haven't actually achieved your goal? So we talk about how you might be able to succeed with multi-row applications and where you need to rein it in. Uh, I'm always reminded in a nursery situation of people that try to spray through multiple rows of cedars. And I asked one operation, how many are you trying to spray through? Seven. And what are these trees being grown for? Windbreaks. So why do you think you can spray through seven of them when you're growing them so that one row will stop wind? So, you know, we have to be cognizant of what a sprayer can do and what it can't. And that's what this chapter is about. Measuring sprayer air. Uh, I confess this was what one of the other authors brought to the table and it blew my mind. If someone's in the market for a new sprayer and they wanna know which one's best for their operation, when the three of us got together, we developed a way for you to do just a couple of simple calculations, real back of the napkin stuff. You'll know very quickly if your sprayer is overpowered for the job or underpowered for the job. And it's really just a couple of cheap diagnostic tools and the willingness to get a tape measure. Uh, surprising applicability that I can't wait to get out into the real world and show people in person. Configuring air settings. I've harped on about the importance of air. We dedicate a lot of this book to controlling air, diagnosing air, correcting air. And you'll find chapters 10 and 11 are just full of cheap, easy, qualitative ways for you to do that. You don't need to know the 15 different factors that'll affect where air goes. You just need to know what the end result of them all working together will do. And we can do that with some ribbons. It's really quite simple. We talk about transfer efficiency in chapter 12. Uh, once you release a droplet from the sprayer, you're done controlling where it goes. And there are really only so many fates that it can have. So we talk about what those fates are and what affects it. Once it finally arrives at the canopy, then what? Well, surface structure, runoff, droplet density, vertical targets, greasy targets. We talk about ways to improve how much spray is actually retained. Again, once it's released from your sprayer, you lose control. So you hope it gets from A to B, and then once it arrives at B, you hope it stays there. And we talk to you how to improve your odds and how to distribute flow over the sprayer to match your canopy. We dip into rate, dose, and coverage in chapter 14. I won't belabor that. I know we're a bit behind. And this, assessing coverage. Um, it's almost silly to think that you would put so much time and money and energy into crop protection and then spray until the tank's empty and hope you got it done right. Without some form of feedback for you to know if you achieved your goal, you're guessing. And we talk about multiple ways, uh, some far better than others, that you can not only assess and diagnose your coverage, but what to do if you don't like what you see. Uh, and you'll see here the water sensitive paper that uh, I still think is the best and some interesting cheap and fun ways that you can work with fluorescent dyes. Something I've avoided in my early career because a lot of them were toxic, but I've since found suppliers of, in fact, it's Crayola of all people, cheap, non-toxic children's face paint. If you dilute it and buy some 31 or 51 LED black lights, it's remarkable what you can learn quickly. And we had a lot of fun using these in Australia. Ah, uh, calibration. How can you talk sprayers until you get into math? But in my defense, you'll note we didn't get there till chapter 16. But we go through all the different ways that you calibrate a sprayer. Do you, are you using the correct pressure? Are your nozzles worn out? Are you driving the speed you think you're driving? And 
How can driving in mud or having a slightly deflated tire change all of that? I think you'd be surprised. Uh, earlier, I said there were multiple forms of atomization on a sprayer, but I do know and recognize that Ontario mostly uses hydraulic nozzles. And if you're doing any kind of weed management, you certainly need to know how to read nozzle tables and understand what nozzles are and how they work. And uh, chapter 17 goes into that. 18, loading and mixing. Why we don't chuck six things into an ice cold tank, uh, which order we put them in and how you can keep yourself safe and ensure that those products are going to work the way they were intended to work. How to uh, reduce the odds of antagonism, how to reduce the odds of it drifting away because of a formulation you didn't realize was capable of doing that. And ways for you to diagnose perhaps tank mixes that aren't labeled, what a jar test is, and something that Mike Cobra, our, our weed specialist and I came up with, we're dubbing it the reverse jar test, because frankly, sometimes you make mistakes. And if you do end up with a sprayer of goo, you want to figure out how to break that down and remove it safely without making the problem worse by adding unknown detergents and hot water to it. So we go, we go into all that. We're getting near the end. You're being very patient. Sprayer sanitization is something that I think Canada, North America, uh, has a long way to go. We, we just don't think about it. We think, oh, it's just fungicides. Oh, I mean, I'm, it's only a little amount. Ah, no one will ever look at that pile of yellow rocks in the farm where I constantly rinse and clean the sprayer in the same spot over and over. We have to stop doing this. We have to change the way we think about this. We're so concerned with drift, which only represents a very small amount of how much product can leave an operation, that we don't talk enough about runoff and point source contamination which is 15% of the problem, uh, not two. And we can deal with all of it, every bit of it. So it's something that the book, I think, may open some eyes. Start up in storage, all the mechanical do's and don'ts for your sprayer, and stewardship. And we left this for last because while we didn't want to get preachy, and don't you love that picture on the left? That blew me away, no pun intended but that is a real nut operation in Florida. Um, stewardship is the kind of thing where if you do everything in the first 20 chapters, you're 95% of the way there. You will have controlled the fate of all the spray leaving your sprayer, and you'll have done a wonderful thing uh, under, the, under the topic of stewardship, perhaps without even intending to do so. It's a nice part of my job that if I improve your coverage and reduce your waste, uh, we've done the environment a favor at the same time. The book also had some appendices, and these are like <laughs> proud children that we, we just didn't want to get rid of. We couldn't resist. So you'll find four in there. There's one on how to size a pump if you're ever in a, a position where you need a new pump. There's an appendix about electrostatics, uh, often oversold for what it's capable of doing, but not necessarily a bad thing. Rate controllers. Uh, I was talking to a field sprayer uh, friend and he said i read your article on rate controllers what year is it for air blast sprayers like we've had these 25 years and i said well for us it's 1985. so if you don't have a rate controller it's something you should consider and we talk all about it and finally sprayer math product rate calculations so we released this book to the wild less than two months ago uh, and i've got a neat little piece of tracking software We've had 550 digital downloads of this book in 27 countries in less than two months, which I'm obnoxiously proud of because while uh, I am Ontario based, we did intend this to hit a global audience and make it relevant for people. And it seems to be slowly doing that. Although you can see Canada and the US are the biggest downloaders of the book. So we'll get right into it now. That's the book and it's available for you. It was written for you and it's free. You can order a copy in print if you prefer. Uh, this time around, I went through print on demand. That way we don't keep an inventory and we don't take checks and we don't ship things, which is really not my job and not what I wanted to do. But uh, I actually prefer a printed copy. So I wanted that to be available to people who wanted it as a reference book. If you go to sprayers101.com, uh, you can do backslash airblast101. It'll take you directly to the page where you can uh, get your hands on a copy of this digital for free or um, at cost in print. Or you can just go to Spurs 101 
and type Air Blast 101 into the search bar. And this can be yours. And since you're all home in your kitchens, in your bedrooms, in your private offices, there's no excuse for you to open a new window right now and type this in. When you do go to Sprayers 101, if you're not aware of it, this is a website that I developed with Dr. Tom Wolf, and it is everything you never wanted to know about spraying. We, uh, we have everything on there from comics to productivity calculators to articles written by authors worldwide on the subject of spraying uh, and anything that sort of touches spraying. And it's nonprofit, you know, we only do it because we want to provide good information. Um, it's there for you. And I, I hope that as nursery people, you think, ah, that's for apples or that's for grapes. Don't, don't think that way. It's few and far between that we're going to have specific workshops or talks based on your particular crop. There's a lot of lateral learning that can take place, a, a lot of things that are pertinent to you, even if perhaps the commodity uh, isn't something that you thought would be relevant. So if you ever hear sprayer talk or sprayer workshop, I encourage you to try to get your hands on some of that information and see if maybe you can make some of it uh, relevant to what you do. So that's it. I'll stop sharing my screen. I'll be around for questions uh, with the panel. You needn't ask about the book. You can always ask me sprayer questions. I don't mind that one bit. Lovely. Thank you, Jason. It's it's so true. There's been so many times where we've seen failures and in, in pest management applications, and it's been one of these items that he's talked about here today. And Jason has done some applied workshops with the nursery industry, um, and I know many of you have benefited from that. So it's really wonderful to see. Um, if you wouldn't mind pasting your link into the chat, people could get get it from there directly too. Sure, I'll and do it right now. it's just the right of your screen, yeah, that'd be lovely. Um, Mary Jane, do we have you on that you, we could try your audio? No, okay, no, that's not good. Okay, so you can maybe talk to Amy about something, an alternative. Uh, <clears throat> okay, no worries. So, just gonna look at my agenda. So potentially if we have, uh, if we have Kara. Hi, Jen. There she is. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Wonderful. So our next speaker, is Kara McCreary. She is the Greenhouse Vegetable Specialist for Integrated Pest Management with OMAFRA. So another OMAFRA specialist. You guys are so lucky today uh, <laughs> to have more of the team here. Uh, she works out of Harrow and she's been doing that since 2015. Kara has a Master of Science degree in Environmental Biology from the University of Guelph. Welcome, Kara. Thank you. All right. So you have just under 30 minutes. So until 1115. Perfect. Can you, um, can you see my slides? Okay. Yes. Okay. And you're not seeing my presenter view. Not yet. Okay. Here we go. There you go. Okay, there we go. All right, thanks, Jen. Um, <clears throat> okay, so thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, I was really looking forward to this and I have to tell you a, a little bit of an extra background <laughs> about me um, that I think is relevant to this sector. Um, but I actually took a nursery production course in college, it feels like a million years ago. Um, and, you know, that led, you know, I was taking horticulture and that led me to a couple of different jobs in, um, in, uh, in um, garden centers and landscaping, excuse me, and things like that. And I really 
really kind of um, catapulted me into the position that I'm in now because my love for plants really led to this love for pest management. And now I work with uh, greenhouse vegetable producers, but it all started with um, horticulture and nursery and um, landscaping and things like that. So it's pretty exciting for me to be here today. And I, on a very personal level, I really appreciate all the work that uh, nursery producers do because I'm a big lover of gardening. And so if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have so many fun plants to play with. Um, Anyways, I'm, I'll jump into my <laughs> my talk for today. Um, but, you know, I feel like maybe I should change my talk to Clean Out 101 to follow Jason's suit or Sanitation 101. Um, but that's essentially what I'm going to talk about today is um, cleaning out your greenhouse. And so, you know, as you know, I work with greenhouse vegetable producers. Um, but there's a lot of similarities, I think, in the needs as far as, um, you know, cleanliness and sanitation and disinfection and things like that. So Jen, uh, thankfully, she introduced me to a couple of nursery growers who gave me a bit of extra information. And I'm really grateful for that. So I could see sort of where things um, line up and, and what might be different in nursery production. So basically, what I'm going to talk about today is cleaning and disinfecting, um, the why, the how, the what, and um, I'll dig a little bit deeper into disinfectants themselves, and we'll talk about factors affecting their efficacy um, and some different types of disinfectants. So hopefully, um, you know, you can take away some new information today or at least be um, reaffirmed that what you're doing is exactly the right thing. Uh, so for starters, why do we clean up? Um, this seems like relatively simple, um, you know, explanation here, but it really is. So we're trying to reduce um, pests. We're trying to reduce pest pressure. We're pathogens, insects and mites. Um, and, you know, in the sector that I work in, we don't tend to deal with weeds so much in the greenhouse. The odd one pops up here and there. Um, but that's also a pest that may be of concern for a lot of producers as well. So that's ultimately what we're trying to do is to reduce pest pressure from crop to crop, from season to season, from year to year. Um, and what happens is when we reduce, effectively reduce pest pressure, then our IPM programs are much more successful. And specifically, <clears throat> and especially I'm referring to biological control or natural enemies. So these are, are you know, beneficials that come in and help us take care of pests in our crops. Um, and they're, they're, they have a much easier job to do when they're not completely overwhelmed by pests. And so, you know, I kind of like to think of a clean out in the greenhouse between crops, um, between crop cycles as an opportunity for a new beginning. So that's one thing, you know, that's difficult for anyone who's sort of in continuous production. Um, but hopefully some of the things that I talk about today, you can still kind of picture how they can be applied during production year round. <clears throat> so how do arthropods survive between crops? Um, so this you know, a lot of times um, we talk about crop cleanout in the vegetable, greenhouse vegetable space as being um, during the winter months, because that is kind of a common time frame for them to be cleaning out. Um, but there, you know, it could happen any time through the year and depending on the crops that you're producing, uh, a lot of these things still apply. So um, when you empty out your greenhouse and you're plant free inside, all of those little critters will try to find somewhere to hide or somewhere to live or somewhere, you know, maybe somewhere to feed in between uh, these crop cycles. So there's some really common areas um, where they might hide. So various crevices in the flooring. Um, I know, you know, we used a lot of um, the white plastic on the floor. Um, but underneath that is the, the mesh usually. There's still a lot of producers and vegetables that use that mesh. And I understand that that's used um, fairly commonly in nursery production as well. Um, so all of those things, any sort of crack or crevice is a great place to hide if you're an insect or a mite. 
Um, diapausing, so this is a way that they can sort of overwinter, they can, um, you know, they're effectively not metabolizing anything, so they're sort of hibernating or sleeping, and um, insecticides don't work, miticides don't work, because they're basically just at rest. So that's a great way to survive between crops. Um, but this would be something that occurs usually, you know, in the fall through and through the winter months. And then alternate hosts. So any weeds in or outside of uh, the greenhouse space is a great place to hang out. And then cull piles or any sort of disposed plant material um, piled or spread behind the greenhouse <clears throat> is also a great place to hide. Along similar lines with um, pathogens, they can produce some survival structures that can help them overwinter, just like diapods in arthropods. These are structures that can help them survive, you know, some challenging weather during the winter months. Um, they can also survive for quite a long time on crop debris. Um, so piling or spreading plant material, waste material, um, behind the greenhouse can can be a place for them to hang out until your next crop comes. Um, and then, of course, alternate hosts like weeds. And then the other thing that's really challenging uh, when it comes to a lot of pathogens is their ability to survive on various surfaces away from a host. Um, and some of them can survive for very long periods of time, years or more. So <clears throat> this is one of the focuses of clean out is to kind of talk about how we can minimize um, all of those those uh, places where they survive between crops. And so I'll draw your attention to the disease triangle. So I'm sure many of you have heard of this before, but um, basically what you have is um, three things that are necessary to create plant disease. So you need a pathogen present, you need an appropriate host, and you need um, an environment that's conducive to that pathogen developing. And so all of those three, three things um, combine together to basically determine how much disease there is. And so one of the ways that we can reduce the amount of disease is by reducing one of those things. And so during cleanout, what we're trying to do is reduce the amount of pathogens. Um, so you can also kind of think of this in terms of insects as well. Um, but for the purposes here, I'm going to uh, talk about pathogens specifically. And <clears throat> so here's your little greenhouse here. And so this is where cleanout comes into play where you're trying to reduce the pathogen pressure and ultimately that will reduce the amount of disease um, in your crops. So I'll start with a couple of just basic clean out considerations. Um, you know, some of this may or may not apply depending on uh, the types of crops you're growing, but um, it's really important to kind of think about uh, when you're removing crops from your greenhouse, whether they're being disposed of or whether they're being, um, you know, they're, they're saleable items, maybe you're taking out. But as soon as you kind of disturb them, if there's a lot of pest pressure on there, um, those pests, the pathogens, the arthropods, they can all just kind of disperse and fall to the ground and land somewhere in that greenhouse, even though you're bringing those plants out. So one thing we usually um, try to encourage is treating the crop before you take it out of the greenhouse um, because that reduces the amount of, um, you know, sort of leftover that falls off the plants before you take them out. Um, and then, you know, this next point really about maintaining warm temperatures and low humidity really has to do with cleanouts that happen in the fall and winter. And so a good example here um, is pepper weevil. And I know this is not a pest that you would be concerned with, but, um, but we have a lot of solid information and a lot of solid data uh, supporting this type of thing. And it would be a similar um, situation for a lot of other pests. But what happens is as the temperatures start decreasing, um, these insects start to kind of go to sleep. And so, you know, you can take an insect and put it in your fridge and it will fall asleep. You can leave it there for a week. You can take it out and it wakes up and it's happy as can be. And so you know, when you're cleaning out during the winter months and temperatures are low, 
whatever insects or mites are in there, they're basically just sleeping in a corner somewhere. And so um, when you keep, when you heat up the greenhouse, when you, when you warm those temperatures, when you have no food available and no water available, that's where the low humidity comes in, those insects and mites are actively metabolizing and they're in need of food and water. And so you're essentially starving them um, and so that's one of the reasons why during a clean out in the winter months, you know, it's a good idea to heat. I know this is a hard sell sometimes because it costs money, you know, to heat a greenhouse in the winter unnecessarily, but it, it is something that does help reduce pest pressure. Um, and then, you know, a few other things to keep in mind are to heat and vent to rid the pests or the greenhouse of pesticide residue. So on the right hand side here, you can see a picture of some damage to a cucumber crop from Dibrom and DDB, DDBP fogging. Um, and then it's also a really good idea to continue to monitor for pests um, throughout the clean out. So there's, you know, I find growers are really resourceful sometimes and really creative with their monitoring efforts. So we've had situations where, um, you know, pepper weevil was a big challenge for us in pepper production. And they ended up after their clean outs, putting in a few trap plants. Um, so a few peppers before they planted their new crop and set up some traps and they really could draw out whatever pepper weevil was left in there before they planted their new crop. So, you know, just keeping keeping those kinds of things in mind um, as you continue through the clean out process. Um, so now moving on to how do we clean out? So this is probably the most important slide that I'm gonna show you today. And I don't want this to be your, permission to stop paying attention to me <laughs> um, because I'm going to try to explain why I think this is the most important slide and hopefully it's my job to kind of convince you um, that these steps are really important um, for clean out but basically I used to have this in many more steps I think I had nine or ten steps and I kind of nailed it down to just three because there's three there's a lot of things involved but there's three critical steps to a thorough clean out. And if you follow those three steps, you're way ahead of the game. Um, and order really matters. So the first step is to remove organic matter. So what I'm talking about here is basically dry removal or dry cleaning, where you're, you know, getting rid of any organic matter on the surfaces as much as you can before moving on to the second step, which is washing with a detergent. Rinsing is important and drying is important before you move on to the next step. Um, and the last step would be disinfection. And this should always be the last step and it should always happen after those first two. And I'll explain why in more detail momentarily. And you might wonder why I have this tooth. <laughs> and a toothbrush and toothpaste up there. Um, but I, I was given this analogy from somebody um, actually that's retired now that worked for Vitoconol. And I love it. I think it's so, it just really kind of drives the point home. But when you want to clean your teeth, you don't just swish around some mouthwash and spit it out and think that your teeth are clean, right? So that's like the mouthwash is like your disinfectant. <clears throat> you might have fresh breath for a couple minutes, but you haven't actually like cleaned your teeth properly, right? So the first thing we always do is take a toothbrush and toothpaste. So that's like your detergent um, and you get rid of that organic matter on your teeth. And then you swish around your mouthwash as sort of a little extra assurance, right? That you cleaned your teeth well enough and you got rid of all the bacteria. So I love that comparison because it really is a similar idea when we think about cleaning out a greenhouse. Um, so now what do we clean? Basically everything, anything, um, tools and equipment, the structure and the irrigation system. So I'm gonna go into a bit of detail about all three of those things, but I know sometimes it might seem a little overwhelming when you look around your greenhouse and you see all these different surfaces and you just don't even know where to start. So one thing I often will tell um, the producers that I work with is that 
you kind of try to assess your situation, think of what are the highest risk areas in my greenhouse and start there and kind of perfect the cleaning there. And then you can start including other things, you know, but if you're, if this is kind of new to you, then, um, you know, that's, it's a good place to just kind of start somewhere. So, um, so, so basically I'm going to go through the three steps and a little bit more specifics around what I'm talking about, what surfaces. Um, and so step one, as I said, is remove organic matter. This is a really, really, really critical step in the clean out process. Um, and I love this, this um, quote here from Bill Jarvis. So he said, one gram or just a pinch of dirt contains greater than 10,000 fusarium spores and only one spore is needed for infection. So, you know, fusarium's everywhere. It may not always cause disease issues, but just keeping in mind that these, you know, these pathogens and these spores um, are kind of all over the place and especially in dirt, you know, that it just kind of really ma makes you think about how much <laughs> is happening there that we can't really see with our two eyes, right? Um, so basically what we're talking about, um, you know, is removing, like I said, the, the dry matter, the, it's the dry removal, removing <clears throat> any sort of plant material, dirt, crop debris, any, you know, plastic or whatever that can have plant sap on it, anything like that really should be removed. And that includes weeds. Um, and there's a couple of different ways you can do that. You can sweep or you can vacuum, um, you know, really paying attention to corners and nooks and crannies. Um, we have, you know, troughs that we use in greenhouse vegetables. And I know, you know, maybe benches or other things are common in other crops. Um, but we actually have some producers that will walk with a mirror on a big long stick <laughs> down the rows um, and look for for you know, fruit or plant material that's kind of stuck under the troughs, and it's amazing what they find under there. Um, so in this top picture um, on the right-hand side, I love this picture because it's got you know all kinds of things growing up on this ledge. And I was talking to a producer once who was dealing with a pretty significant fusarium issue, and and was really certain that he did like a really thorough clean out. So he couldn't quite understand why um, he was dealing with this fusarium. And, you know, I kind of looked up and I saw these big chunks of like mossy stuff growing above like the rafters and the, the, um, the um, vents and, you know, kind of growing out from everywhere. And that's essentially what we're looking at. This is near like a, a roof vent. Um, but, you know, I said, when's the last time you cleaned those out? And he said, oh, well, it's way up there. I don't usually do that. And so we kind of talked about a strategy for him to get up there safely, you know, and scrape all that stuff out, maybe power wash it. Um, and, you know, he saw a pretty big reduction in fusarium after that. So, you know, there's definitely some, some things to pay attention to there. And then I have at the bottom here um, about replacing old floor covering. So I mentioned, you know, we tend to use a lot of like the white plastic cover um, floor covers in greenhouse vegetables, but we also have a lot of producers that use the mesh um, and those sometimes can be compromised. There's tears and rips and holes and gaps. Um, and they also need to be cleaned really well because a lot of you know, plant material and gook and dirt can get stuck in the, the mesh particles. Um, but basically, you know, if you have a lot of rips and tears, it might be time to replace it. Or, you know, I'm not sure if it would work for everybody, but this clear, pla clear white plastic covering um, has really done a lot of good for our IPM and greenhouse vegetables as well. Okay, so step two, washing with um, the equipment and um, and the structure with detergent. So basically, you know, there's a couple different ways you can do that. Um, scrubbing any items that are scrubbable. So I have one, uh, one producer who tells me anything that's green. So this is a, a tomato crop where a lot of things turn green, but anything that's green gets scrubbed. Um, 
you know, anything that's kind of out of reach or, or not realistically scrubbed gets power washed, right? Um, so you can do that. Some people choose not to use a detergent, but the detergent really helps kind of break up any organic matter that's left over or kind of jammed into different, you know, the different surfaces like concrete and things like that. Um, so adding a detergent, some kind of soap can really help get rid of the rest of the organic matter because this is one of our big focuses here is to get rid of organic matter. Um, so the other thing that's important, especially when you're using a detergent, is that it gets rinsed after. We don't want detergent or soap residue left on these surfaces because that will impact our final step. Um, so you want to rinse it and you want it to dry and it should be completely dry before you move on to your next step here. Um, one last thing I want to point out, if you look at the very bottom picture here, so this was a picture provided by a nursery producer um, that I had a nice conversation with. And, and it's interesting because this story, um, it, I've had some very similar situations in some microgreen, uh, with some microgreen producers that I've dealt with too. But basically what we talked about was um, they were disinfecting their trays. They're reusing their trays. They're good quality. They're hard to find, you know, so they're reusing them. Well, but, um, oh, I'm getting feedback now all of a sudden. <laughs> Um, so they're, sorry, they're reusing them, but um, they were disinfecting and not cleaning them first. And so there was still a lot of like organic matter and things like that. They weren't getting cleaned before the disinfection. So once they realized, um, you know, they were still having a lot of disease issues when they started to um, get rid of the organic matter first and clean the organic matter first, then the disinfection started to to work better and was much more effective and they saw some uh, a reduction in disease pressure. So that's uh, pretty exciting. And then lastly, as I mentioned, disinfection. So you're doing the same sort of thing with equipment um, and the structure. The order matters, um, you know, as far as these steps go, but also as far as your cleaning and disinfecting. And so when you think about cleaning and disinfecting the inside of the greenhouse, so you want to start at the roof and you want to work your way down because if you start at the floor and then you do the roof, you're just dropping all that stuff on the floor again. Um, and I have, uh, you know, another producer that I was talking to that he was dealing with some bacterial um, disease issues. And, you know, literally it seemed like it was raining this bacterial hanger all over his crop. Um, I'm getting feedback again. <laughs> <laughs> maybe oh sorry um we'll keep going here so um anyway so <laughs> it was raining bacterial disease all over his crop so what we figured out was he kind of was rushing through his clean out and he skipped the the roof washing and so the you know the next few clean outs he did he really focused heavily on cleaning that um, the, the roof and doing it properly. And he saw a huge reduction in bacterial disease in his next crops. Um, so again, you know, basically a lot, a lot of people really want to know what disinfectants to use. This is a really tough one. And I'm going to talk a bit more about that momentarily, but it really has a lot to do with what pathogens you have. Um, you know, pick your worst pathogen and choose a product based on that. Okay, so just quickly, I'm gonna mention a few things about irrigation systems because this is part of our clean out and sanitation, um, but you wanna remove the drippers from any growing media, but keep the, the lines slightly charged to keep them moist to avoid the salts and any other um, residue from drying in the lines because then it's near impossible to clean it out after that. Um, disconnecting all your sensors, removing filters, um, and replace emitters when necessary. Sometimes they can get clogged. Um, so you want to make sure that all this is done at the same time as cleaning your structure and equipment. Um, so stock tanks, return or dirty leach tanks if you're 
uh, recirculating water, freshwater tanks, all of those things should be cleaned. The emitter stakes can be soaked in an acid solution for up to 48 hours. I know some producers that like to pretend like these buckets are like a washing machine, so they will frequently go over and kind of swish them around and try to break things up in that 48 hours. Um, and then as far as flushing the lines goes, here's like a pretty general guideline of how to do that. So you wanna flush with water first, then flush with acid. There's a couple different op options, um, but it's important to kind of check with the manufacturer of your emitters to make sure that you're using something with the appropriate pH. Um, and then pulsing several times at one hour intervals for a period of 24 hours is actually much more effective than doing a single charge for several hours or just letting it sit. Um, it can really start to break up stuff that's inside. And then you wanna flush with clean water, flush with a disinfectant, and then flush again with clean water. And so that's kind of the nitty gritty of clean out. That's the clean out 101. And so we're just gonna talk a bit more detail about disinfectants uh, specifically and the factors affecting their efficacy and also some different types of disinfectants. And so there's four basic factors that I wanna talk about, organic matter. You can probably tell by now that this is a really important one because <laughs> I've mentioned it many times. Um, the temperature and contact time concentration, and then drying time and type of surface. And so organic matter, as I mentioned, super important um, factor affecting disinfection. And the reason is because it does two, two things. So one, it kind of protects the pathogens. So it's like a place for them to hide. And another is that there's a lot of disinfectants when they come in contact with organic matter that it actually deactivates them and or neutralizes them and so they're completely ineffective at that point and it's a waste of time and money and so here's my little visual for you <laughs> so you're standing outside there's a rain cloud above you and it starts raining what happens you get wet right but if you're standing outside and you're under a tree and it starts raining you're going to be protected so that tree is your organic matter you are the pathogen you know, that's just to kind of give you an idea of what happens. That's a great place to hide. So when that rain hits you or that disinfectant hits you, you're nice and protected. So the second factor is temperature and contact time. Um, so another reason why when you're cleaning out during winter months to have warmer temperatures um, can be helpful because temperature really makes can make a difference with efficacy of disinfectants. Um, so the lower the temperature, the longer the contact time, and the higher the temperature, um, the efficacy is increased. So there's estimates that are around two to three times as, as efficacious for every 10 degrees rise in temperature. Uh, so just something to keep in mind, you know, whatever time of year you're using disinfectants, that if it, the temperatures are low, you might need to extend that contact time for them to be effective. And then contact time is another thing um, that there's really not one single answer. It's It can be very specific to the disinfectant and to the organisms that you're trying to kill. So we have some really stable viruses and you know some products that may be effective after 60 minutes, or we have some you know less, difficult pathogens to kill where sometimes even 60 seconds works, but a minimum of 15 minutes, you know, of a wet surface is probably your best bet. Now concentration, this seems like a, you know, relatively obvious one. So use, follow the label rates, you know, lower than recommended is ineffective. Excessive concentrations can be toxic or corrosive. And so you want to avoid doing that. Um, I better speed up here. I'm running out of time. Um, so drying time and surface characteristics. This is just another thing to consider. You can't always 
um, change the surfaces in your greenhouse, but there are some surfaces that um, encourage rapid drying, like really porous surfaces like wood or concrete. And there's other surfaces that are repellents like polyethylene, polycarbonate, stainless steel, and those kinds of things. And so those pictures at the bottom, you can see those droplet sizes and the difference in the coverage, but organic matter on those surfaces also changes the way the droplets behave um, you know, when they land. And so it's just something to keep in mind when you're really looking at getting good coverage. Whoops. Um, so there's a few general rules for disinfection here, kind of summarize what I've already talked about. Um, but a couple of things I just want to mention that sometimes go missed, but um, we've actually found some, some plant viruses on these different surfaces like door handles and the keyboard in a grower's office and the mouse in a grower's office. And so, you know, these things should be cleaned somewhat regularly um, and, uh, you know, to avoid more contamination. And so the kind of the last thing I want to cover is the types of disinfectants. And there's sort of four main groups. Like I can't um, really go into every single disinfectant um, thoroughly, but just to give you a couple ideas of different disinfectants and where they fall. Um, so we have chlorine and chlorine compounds. So an example would be bleach, I'm sure most of you are familiar with. And this slide, I'm gonna hand out this, um, these slides after as well, but it basically just gives you an idea in general, you know, that bleach is effective against most fungi and bacteria, but maybe inconsistent against viruses. You know, there's temperature requirements, pH requirements, soaking time, and that sort of thing. Um, and it's, you know, different notes on ventilation and, and stuff like that. But all of those things need to be considered when deciding to use bleach or choosing a disinfectant. We'll just have to get you to wrap up in the next minute, Kara. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, Okay, and then quaternary ammonium compounds. So we have a number of um, different products that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, Clean Grow or Upshake or Aquarian. Um, similar kind of idea, so I won't read through all of those things. There's peroxygen compounds. So we have hydrogen peroxide and Vercon. Um, again, you know, just a bit of a summary slide. And then alkali. So these aren't used quite as often in it anymore as I find like trisodium phosphate. Um, but there's definitely some, some differences in their efficacy. So what we tried to do recently, myself and um, the floriculture specialist, we developed this spreadsheet, which we're happy to share. And it goes into a lot more specifics about each individual disinfectant and what the science tells us. Um, so we can share that. There's a lot of detail provided in there. Um, we can share that with Jen and, uh, and she can hand it out to you. This is just the due diligence slide. So remember that um, these things have safety considerations and should be used and stored and disposed of properly. A couple of additional resources um, and that's basically it. So that's my, my end. <laughs> the three steps and order matters. Lovely, thank you so much. I, I know it's it's a lot of information to, to present in, in just half an hour. She normally does that probably in 50 to 60 minutes and yeah. I asked her to do as much <laughs> as she could. Um, Sorry, to I tried maximize. to speed it up. <laughs> and, uh, and congratulations to Kara and her family. Kara's expecting her third baby reasonably soon and you can hear the pauses to breathe in, in yeah. her speech and those of us that have been pregnant remember all too well what that feels like so we really appreciate you taking the time today to yeah. talk to us and Kara is going to share um, it's either a version of her presentation or a handout with us that Amy's going to send all of you uh, so that you'll have you'll have this for reference because it's it's amazing information and it's amazing how just little tweaks like that uh, can really improve your sanitation measures and really reduce pest populations. So thank you so much. Thanks, Jen. And next, uh, I was going to ask Medhat if he could speak next, and I'm sure he's waiting in the wings there. Mr. Medhat Musa. Me? There he is, yes. 
we can All hear right. you. Just gonna set up my lovely audio, and and while you do go. that, I'm I'll introduce you. Okay. Deal. So our next speaker is Medhat Musa. Medhat is a professor at the School of Engineering of the University of Guelph. His research interests and expertise are in interconnected fields of intelligent robotics, artificial intelligence, computer visioning, and computer systems. Meta is also co-founder of the Robotics Institute at the University of Guelph, which is a premier research lab with activity, active industry collaborative partners, such as Landscape Ontario. He's got a project with us. And his current research projects focus on developing advanced robotic systems for applications in uncertain and non-structured environments, such as agriculture, uh, spanning environments such as agriculture, automotive, healthcare. Please welcome Medhat. Thank you, Jen, and thanks everyone. I hope I will not bore you with my presentation today. Um, I think it will be a shorter presentation, but we'll see how it goes. And all I'd say is when you share your screen, use the application window share. So the share the screen is just to the right of your microphone. Yep. And you don't it. want to share your whole screen, just share the application window of your presentation. Okay. All right, so um, yeah, okay, share. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, that'll work better. And Kara, if you're on, still listening, um, there's a couple of chat questions for you if you'd like to answer them, or you can wait till the end, no problem. Sure. Do here. that right in the chat, Jeff. You for can. What? Keys for the transporter. Uh, I gave them back to her. They're in the door. Okay, so every everybody who's a speaker, if you're not med hat, can you mute? Uh, Olivia had it last night. I took the collection truck home last oh. night. Mary Jane, can you mute your your line there? Just press your microphone button and mute. Okay, how is this is looking? I cannot see anymore the actual. Uh, Beautiful, looking so I, good. Yeah, just. Uh, on my window, I do not see the chat. So if anyone would like to actually ask a question, this is a different uh, how we are actually teaching. No worries. We can do it at the end, Medhat. We have Perfect. a question answer session. We're good. Perfect. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, everyone. Um, so today I'm going to uh, talk to you about a project that started in April. And it was actually, we made uh, a lot of good progress, even with all of the COVID restrictions. Um, so I'm going to give you an idea about what the project is about and uh, the progress, and then leave you with a little bit of thoughts. And hopefully that will generate uh, a lot of questions at the end. So what is the problem? So we started with a uh, a basic problem, and that is that uh, the nurseries will need to keep track of uh, trunk measurements of every tree. Um, and this process, as you know, is tedious. Uh, it's prone to errors. Uh, in some cases, people will just eyeball the uh, the category of the tr uh, of the trunk measurement, and of course, it's labor intensive. So the solution that we looked at is how we can automate this process. And the automation will basically not only measure the, uh, the, the trunk at 15 centimeters, um, but also store all of this in a digital library. And the digital library can then provide you with an immediate uh, status of all of the trees in the inventory. Um, in addition to trunk measurements, we can also measure things like, for example, leaf density. We can also measure the height of the tree. Um, the project was funded by OMAFRA, started in April uh, of last year. And actually, co-investigators is Jennifer and Jean Vanavert from OMAFRA. Uh, we started uh, in terms of partners from nursery with uh, the Krauss nursery, but then we also added later on NVK and uh, Winkel Mullen uh, Nursery. Uh, in addition to myself from the University of Guelph team, there is also two research uh, engineers that work on this project, uh, Patrick Spanielli and Colterry 
Patrick has since moved to the private sector. He, um, he was working on this as a postdoc. So let me give you an idea about the system design here, and I will leave you then with some uh, pictures. So essentially, conceptually, is you've got two, th two uh, basic uh, components. One is the robot. In this case, it is basically uh, an add-on to a tractor or, or, a, or a cart that is pulled by a tractor. It is not an autonomous robot moving in the field by itself because that will generate by itself a lot of safety issues. Um, and that machine has uh, cameras and it has computing and it has storage facilities, all of that in that machine. Uh, we call this the machine vision station. Um, the, the machine vision station collects the data, analyze some of the data, and then send all of this to additional support software. And uh, DSCS basically will analyze the images, will find different measurements, and then will store uh, this data um, in a database with every tree location in the field. So this is a picture of the mobile vision station. And this is really a prototype. This is not the final uh, uh, look of it, uh, but I don't know if you can see, I'm going to actually use my laser pointer here. So uh, here, there, this is a collection of cameras right here and as well as here, okay? And inside this box, um, there are computer systems, okay? That will take all of these pictures uh, all of these images and do uh, what's called edge computing, some image processing initially here. And in this tower, you are going to have an RTK GPS unit, which can allow you to have location plus or minus a few centimeters. So it's quite accurate. Um, the idea is at this point is that this is basically pulled behind the tractor but the idea later on is to actually put this on a tractor or attach it to a tractor or something like that. It is possible in the future that this becomes a completely autonomous robot, but there's no need for, for that. Um, this picture you can see here is actually taken in the backyard of, I think it was Patrick's home, because during COVID we did not have access to our research uh, facilities at the university. And there are some information about the kind of cameras that we we, we are using. Uh, some for, um, this is an RGB uh, D, which is for depth as well as images. And this camera is actually for localization and what's called SLAM. Um, and then you've got the image processing using actually deep learning. Let me now show you the back end. This is what the back end uh, Markup, which is actually now having implemented a test, it would look like. Um, you would ha have basically um, an image, let's say from uh, Google Map, and then you've got rows of uh, the trees, and in each row you will have all kinds of details. The details will go all the way to every tree. Um, and you can click on one row, it gives you a, a, a measurements of the kind of sizes that you are looking at, click on every tree, and then you've got additional information. Um, you have here additional information about the type of the tree that you are also looking at. So um, what is the current status of this project? So we did field testing, we built the prototype, we built the back end uh, uh, DCS uh, algorithm, we, we built some image processing algorithm and we did three field tests, uh, July, August and November. And this is important in, this, in, this, in, in the early stages because what we do is that we do um, ground truthing. So basically, um, the, the nursery will actually measure with a caliber uh, the way they normally measure, you know, a row of trees. And then our 
our um, uh, robot will, will go through this and then produce its own measurements. And then we can uh, compare uh, uh, the accuracy and how things are working. So you can see here just a picture of uh, a couple of trees. And you can see this is the measurement here at the trunk, okay, at this level. Uh, here is 45.6 millimeter, 18.5. And you can immediately realize that we can produce with this system uh, accuracy up to 0.1 millimeter, which is really not needed. You are looking at, at, at categories, but uh, this is what you can you can get from this system. Um, now, let me show you some of the results. And these are early results, okay? Um, the difference between the, what the robot produce and actually what um, the nursery is measuring, and that's a, another issue, is around two and a half millimeters, okay? And you've got like 20, 20 trees here. It's important to note here is that when, when we were doing this, there was actually far more differences even when a person is eyeballing a tree measuring a tree sometimes the tree actually is not exactly around it's a kind of oval uh, so there are even humans doing this measurement there are a lot of variation and that creates problems when you are your ground truthing itself is not accurate but this is the early results um, as you know the measurements is the, all of the measurements has gone into categories into bins so if you are looking at, okay, not, not the, the, the absolute error number, but actually the error in categorizing the tree size, you will find that we have in 70% of the cases that trees were, were correctly categorized, 15% they were off by one category, and in 15% they were off by two categories. The error was significant. <clears throat> Now, all of this is done multiple times. These are the latest results from 23 row. We will need to do far more than that to be actually able to say this is, this is the current accuracy of the system. So this is very early. Um, while we are doing this work, we stumble on another application from a different nursery. And that application was, is that the nursery will use color markers to identify the tree quality, canopy, tree categories, stuff like that. You can see uh, some of the color coding here. <clears throat> and, uh, and what they really wanted is, is to uh, recognize these colors okay and basically register all of the trees in the database okay these are smaller trees they are not they're not concerned about the, the trunk diameter but uh they said just just read this and that's that's what we did this is relatively uh relatively as a relative to other things uh, not as as difficult and so this these are Early results again coming from uh, from from uh, from the nursery, and uh, I think that this is something we'll be able to implement in in the final version of the system. Okay, so where are we right now? And lessons learned on the current plan moving forward. So we'll take you a few things here. First of all, there is that problem in terms of getting precise ground truth. The same person, not different people, the same person measuring the same tree will have significant variations, different categories, okay? Between eyeballing the tree, between measuring the tree from one angle, measuring the tree from a different angle. So the way we are going to deal with this is that we are gonna take many readings at different heights, okay? So uh, especially to take uh, to, to, to remove this problem of about root flare, okay? And then take the average of these readings. We can do that. It will take more time for a person to actually do that, but 
but the system can actually do that quite easily. Um, the other thing, as I said, is that you can actually have a tree that is a kind of an oval shape at the trunk. So, uh, and how do you deal with that? So we're gonna take different angles, okay? And then also take, take, the, uh, take the average. The other thing is that the support stick sometimes makes it very difficult you can put the support stick sometimes it's very very close and and very uh the color is very very similar that you you might actually think that this is the same but uh so taking taking different angles uh will remove that uh, the current system speed is about seven kilometers an hour it's kind of a walking speed but uh, we can actually, and I'm talking here about this speed. This is the speed by which it can take images and process them uh, in real time. Uh, we are working on fine tuning this so that the number increases to 30 kilometers an hour. Uh, the processing speed, so you are acquiring things 30 kilometers an hour, you, you cover uh, uh, probably half of your nursery in, in one day. Um, and, and, and then you've got the processing speed itself. So at this time, we are looking at three seconds per image or about 1200 image an hour. Um, obviously, if you are collecting images from a nursery that has 200,000 trees, uh, you would like to actually increase this processing so that you can get things in a reasonable time. Uh, so right now, the system can process around 10,000 trees a day. We would like to increase that to become 50,000 trees a day. So if you are looking at a 200,000 trees uh, nursery, uh, you are looking at four days, and you will have a complete picture of every tree. Now, people do not uh, do these measurements every day or every week, okay, or every two weeks. But certainly with a system like this, and this is uh, my concluding remarks here. When we started this project, it was all about that it takes so much time. There's errors involved in it. We can save same labor. But actually, once you start having this, this idea about every plant counts, uh, micro precision agriculture, a digital library of every single tree, okay? and automation can enable you to do that, then you're gonna have massive amount of data. You can actually do more frequent measurements. And uh, I work with the greenhouse sector um, and I work also with apple growers um, on different projects. And in the greenhouse sector, for example, this kind of information is so important for them because that can help with yield production and can actually link with their supply chain. Um, when you have all of that as a digital library, when you have all of that as digital library in which you can compare one season versus another, you can look at spraying, for example, efficacy or stuff like that, okay? The other thing is that people are using is actually to optimize your labor because you can actually understand a little bit what your labor is doing. If you are asking people again, in, in the greenhouse industry, for example, to do the leafing operation or even harvest it, okay? Then you, your system, you, this kind of a system can actually take measurements, can actually take images, and then you will know how efficient your labor is in terms of reaching your goals. So I hope that I um, give you an idea of uh, what's going on and the potential, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Medhat. We're going to take questions at the end and okay. we've just got one more speaker. Perfect. So, there you go. So our next speaker is Mary Jane Ash, who's online with us today. And you can hear me? We can hear you, yay. Wonderful. Well, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you to Amy, who's again, Amy Buchanan from Landscape Ontario is working behind the scenes to make sure that 
uh, this all functions properly. It's fantastic. We had a little bit of issues with a couple of speakers with um, with the web browser that they're using uh, to log into the platform. So, but we're all good now. So Mary Jane is the propagation manager for Sheridan Nurseries Norvell. She's been doing so for the last 10 years. She's currently in her 16th year at Sheridan Nurseries. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture from the University of Guelph. Welcome, Mary Jane. Thank you very much for having me today. And uh, thank you again for all your help and and for being adaptable and, uh, and taking care of me, getting me going. Uh, hello and good morning to everyone. Um, yes, uh, my name is Mary Jane and uh, I am the Propagation Manager at Sheridan and I'm very honoured to deliver this presentation to you today. Um, so this, I just wanted to specify that this presentation is uh, just on our Norval site specifically, um, although we do have several, several sites. Uh, oops, oops, not too far. So uh, I know everyone who grows um, knows water is extremely important. So I just like to put a little quote together that sort of sums it all up. Um, and the background for our Norval farm. So uh, Sheridan purchased this site in 1985. It's uh, smaller of the two farms. We're about 83 acres and uh, we are sort of stuck right in the middle of several uh, sprawling urban centers um, between Georgetown and Brampton. And we're sitting just north of the 401 where it runs through Mississauga. So uh, the city is definitely closing in on us and uh, that definitely has an effect on on our water quality. So what do we do here? We are uh, we do the, all the propagation for the company. So we're propagating shrubs, evergreens, broadleaf evergreens and perennials as well. And then we also do container production of perennials, vines and some shrubs. Uh, this area, we're sitting on mainly sand and silty sand and on a Queenston shale bedrock. So uh, a lot of uh, limestone in there. So again, that affects our water. So prior to 2013, our farm sourced most of our water from a natural surface, wa surface pond on the back of our property. Uh, and that all went very well until the early 2000s when this, we noticed the sodium level in the pond water starting to rise. And that seemed to coincide with uh, development in South Georgetown. They were putting in more housing, more roads, and with more roads comes higher salt use. And um, the, uh, the surface pond that we use, it's fed from uh, streams and runoff that originate uh, closer to the south end of Georgetown. So we were experiencing uh, runoff from the, the sodium use in town. Uh, by 2008, that sodium level had risen to an intolerable level. We were seeing uh, levels from 85 to 110 parts per million, and we were definitely seeing effects on our plants. I lost my cursor here. Um, so just a couple of pictures of some sodium damage that we noticed on our plants. Um, on the left is one that's newly planted that, um, you know, really got damaged. And although the, um, the ground under there looks quite dry, you see the crack there, um, that, that's the way our, because we're so sandy when we do overhead irrigation, that's what results is we get kind of a crust. So um, the damage on the plant is not actually from um, dryness, it is actually from the sodium. And on the right there, you can see um, some of that white margin stuff um, that the sodium is giving. So we, we talked about it and investigated options of what we can do. And we decided that really our only feasible option uh, at the time was to drill a well and find different water, better water. So at that time we hired an environmental engineering firm to manage that project uh, because it is quite quite a large project. You know, you need to do test drilling. Um, there's a lot of administration, uh, a lot of liaison with uh, government and ministry, ministry of environment. They need a lot of technical drawings. Um, 
uh, well monitoring of the neighbors and whatnot. So uh, definitely a larger scope than we could handle ourselves. So we hired in for that. And luckily on our third test dig, we secured a good consistent supply of water and that's down around 150 feet deep. And that's still what we're using today. So that quality is good. And the sodium level is pretty consistent um, between 35 and 43 parts per million. And I didn't mention it before, but um, the upper limit that we want to see, we don't want to see anything over 70 parts per million. Generally, you'll see damage after that. And even some sensitive perennial varieties, you'll see damage down into the 50s as well. So if you think back to that, remember the pond, the surface water pond that we kind of abandoned there, um, we continue to actually monitor the sodium levels in there on a regular basis. And we have seen them exceed 200 parts per million uh, several different times over the past few years. So we now water the entire farm with that well water. And this is just a picture of our uh, boxwood bed liners in the field. And you can see now there's no white margins. They're nice and dark green and they look quite happy. However, uh, when we switched water, that sort of revealed to us uh, the next problem. Um, being on that limestone bedrock, uh, the pH of our water is quite high. It's sitting around 7.8 naturally. And uh, most people would know, and I just uh, put a reference there as according to the ANL Canada Laboratories, um, water that's in the range of pH 7 to 8 is considered doubtful for plant growth because uh, it'll really limit a lot of your nutrient availability. And we were definitely seeing deficiencies in our container crops. Um, here's a couple of examples, uh, boxwood on the left. So uh, you'll see like a haloing effect around the leaves. Um, on the right, uh, our big leaf hydrangea or macrophylla varieties were really not a nice color of green at all. They were really quite yellowy. So we knew we needed to do something. So then we decided in 2013 to install an acid injection system to correct that pH. So we put in an inline injection system and uh, we use nitric acid at 67%. Um, the reason we chose that basically was because of the volume of water that we were having to treat. Um, nitric acid kind of gives you a, a big bang for your, the amount that you're using. So that's worked well for us. Um, and the dosing is controlled and monitored by our Argus system. So it will then alarm if the pH gets out of range um, or if anything else goes wrong. So here's just kind of a picture of our setup. So if we start on the right hand side, uh, the water from our deep well is pumped down underground to that cistern at number one. So that cistern holds around 95,000 US gallons of water. Um, and that then is pumped into that little house, number two. Inside the little house is the picture on the left. That's the injection unit. So a pool pump on the bottom, which is that black contraption, uh, sucks in the water and then sends it up through the tree of piping. And uh, it is tested by the probe uh, for pH, EC and temperature. And then at the very top, the acid is injected according to um, the um, information from the feedback. After that, the water is allowed to go into cistern number three in the right hand picture. That cistern holds about 19,000 US gallons, but we, we do that because the acid doesn't instantaneously um, work on the water. It'll, it'll start working instantly, but it needs a few minutes to fully do its job. So we allow it to sit in there. Uh, to kind of mellow out and finish finish what it's doing before pumping it into the greenhouse to be used for irrigation. So this uh, system does get shipped down in the winter. Um, and uh, then in the winter for our propagation, we will use portable dosing units. So maintaining this system, 
Um, as I mentioned before, it is mar monitored by Argus, which is very, very helpful because it, you don't, if your pH were to fall to say, you know, three and a half, you definitely want to be notified of that. Um, we have had an instance where that's happened um, and that's because we've allowed rainwater to mix into the cistern. So rainwater has very little bicarbonates in it. Um, so if your acid is still dosing according to the well water and then some uh, rainwater hits it, your pH is gonna plummet very rapidly. So that has happened to us. Luckily, we have that um, intermediate cistern uh, where we can catch it and, and stop it from going into the greenhouse there. So we've actually had to pump that that small cistern out and purge the water before because we've had a little little oops. And then we we start again, refill it with proper water and we're good after that. Uh, so our we do check our pH manually each morning as a backup. And monthly, we take water samples and send them to um, a third-party accredited lab, such as ANL Canada Labs, uh, for water quality testing and to confirm our pH as well. The system does require some regular cleaning of the pool pump and filters and calibration several times a year as well. And I mentioned the seasonal startup and shutdown before. Some safety considerations, uh, this is mainly for uh, the nitric acid that we're using. Um, so with any acid really, you, you, your building should be locked um, and it should only be accessible to train staff. Any staff that do handle the acid need to be outfitted with the proper PPE. Um, and uh, just a warning as well, if your containers don't get closed properly, especially with nitric acid, any off-gassing of it can damage your building interior, such as any metal conduits or uh, even door hinges or something like that, if you don't have the, the adequate ventilation. Oops. Come on. I've got one more slide here. We're coming here. There we go. So um, some other considerations to think about if you're if you're going to do a, um, add acid to your water to lower your pH, depending on the type that you choose. I mean, there's citric, phosphoric, um, sulfuric, um, nitric. Uh, they all add some sort of nutrient to your water system. The nitric adds about 47 micrograms of nitrogen per liter. Uh, so you can. Um, reduce your, your fertilizer applications as a result. Uh, again, your consistency of bicarbonate levels, uh, that's, this point touches on the uh, well water versus rainwater uh, issue. So uh, if your, your source water is consistent, then an acid system works very nicely. Um, but if your source water is not consistent, um, it might be a little more tricky. Compatibility with fertilizers and pesticides or even with uh, the type of uh, irrigation lines that you have needs to be considered uh, when you're choosing the type of acid. Acid availability, price and volume required definitely comes into play when you are making your decisions as well. And something that was very interesting this past summer with the pandemic, uh, nitric acid actually became unavailable. We could not get it for about three months. Uh, it just was not around and I'm not sure which part of the pandemic they're using it for, but uh, or if it was just a, a transport issue, but um, uh, that was an issue. And these acid containers, we buy them in uh, 200 liter steel drums. Um, they can have hefty deposit fees. So some of the suppliers for those 200 liter steel drums can charge $1,500 deposit per drum. Um, so that is definitely something to consider as well. But through all of those growing pains, um, you know, uh, we, we've come ahead and we've been successful. We're happy where we are now. Um, this year, we are going to be putting another additional layer of treatment into our water system. So maybe, uh, you know, in a few more years, I can talk about that. Um, but uh, treating our water has actually allowed us to expand our offering as well. This next picture shows a crop that we do now, a, a big leaf hydrangea. We now uh, are able to 
grow these and force these into flowers for Mother's Day. So we start them in February inside and they're in flower for Mother's Day and get shipped out. But you can see the nice, beautiful, dark green color that they have. And that is attributed directly to the pH control of the water. If, if we did not control the pH, we could not do this at all. So it's definitely helped us. Uh, it's been a journey. And we've learned a lot, um, but we are happy where we are. And that's all I have for you. I thank you very much. And um, my information is there if you want to uh, contact me and ask me any questions about it. That's all I have today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Mary Jane. This is, uh, this is a, a very, very common issue in nursery production, the alkalinity of our, our water. And the, the key to that acidification is having that residence time, the ability to have the residence contact time before it hits the crop, which Sheridan was in a position to do so with a large volume. Um, but that's, you know, it's, it's not very common to have that kind of setup in space, but hopefully this will inspire some of you um, to see if maybe this might be a solution for your operation because the, I mean, the difference in crop quality is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, before I hit the Q and A session, I uh, wanted to just show our sponsor and platinum partner videos. We have uh, a short video presentation to, to show you, and then we'll have our Q and A session after that, followed by a lunch break. So I'm going to mute my line so it doesn't echo, and I'll just, <clears throat> excuse me, ask any other speakers to mute their line, but you are welcome to remain on video.
Thank you and stay safe. ICL Specialty Fertilizers, a proud sponsor of the Nursery Grower Short Course, would like to introduce H2 Pro Granular Surfactant for incorporation or top dressing. Water is one of the most critical components in nursery production, and H2 Pro is a tool to help optimize water penetration and distribution in the container. This reduces dry spots and channeling, making sure that there is thorough watering with every irrigation. This excellent performance continues through many wet dry cycles, and we all know that better water management means less plant stress both at the nursery and in post-production. H2 Pro is comprised of components which reduce surface tension, improve penetration, and help water to spread through the media. But what makes it truly unique are the three different chain lengths which allow it to be effective over the entire season. Please contact me, Jennifer Waycasey, for additional information. I would be happy to tell you more about H2 Pro. Hi everyone. For those who don't know me, I'm Dave Ritchie, one of the Plant Products Senior Sales Reps. I would like to introduce the next generation of controlled release technology from Plant Products, PureCoat. It is manufactured by Purcell Agritech in their state-of-the-art facility located in Sylacauga, Alabama. Did you know that Purcell has been around for a hundred years? Let's go take a look at the PureCoat. Welcome to the Power of Purple, brought to you by Plant Products, leader in the horticultural fertilizer industry. At Plant Products, we take fertilizer seriously and want to make sure we only bring you the best and newest products available. We started with a few local in-field trials in 2019 and followed these trials through the winter and into the spring of 2020 and then on through the summer of 2020. The trials turned out exceptionally well and the growers involved were very pleased with the results. That brings us today we're ready, where we are ready to offer PureCoat to the rest of the nursery industry. PureCoat is available in 90 day, 120 day and 180 day release types. And we also have a blended shorter term product with 30 and 90 day release all in one bag. Because of Purcell's brand new production facility in Sylacauga, Alabama, and the great relationship we have with them, we will be able to bring to you ongoing new and innovative products as we move ahead. We are ready for the 2021 season. Are you? Speak to one of our great plant product sales reps about the power of purple, pure coat. You will be happy you did. <laughs> it was really good. Wow. Really nice. I, th I think Amy threw some of that together too. I wouldn't be surprised. So let's take a few minutes now. I'm going to go back into the chat. There was a couple of questions um, that I saw. There was a couple from MedHat that I think uh, Cole answered some of them. But you guys... Okay are free now to to type any questions that are in there that you didn't have addressed yet or come to mind now. The nitric acid is used to clean in labs against viruses from Gil. Um, and Medhat, would, would your system work to measure evergreen height as well? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm trying to see uh, any comments here in the chat, but. Uh, and Kara uh, had some comments back from some questions, basically saying, you know, it's really important that the surface, the rinse dries first to increase penetration and so as not to dilute the disinfectant that you're doing in step three. So there's a question there for Jason. What has been the biggest improvement in sprayer tech? in the last decade that you have seen? Uh, maybe some of you remember seven years ago or so, Jen and I brought a, a prototype sprayer into Southern Ontario from Ohio. And 
that sprayer's job was to do something that field sprayers have been doing for a little while now, and that's detect the size, shape, and density of a target, and then change how much spray comes out in relation to it. So basically, it's kind of doing automatically what I'm begging people to do manually. Um, at the time, we couldn't get that sprayer. It was super expensive. It was one of four prototypes, and uh, it was a bit of a tease, if I'm honest. But last year, spraying systems uh, came into being, and they are an aftermarket adjustment for almost any air blast sprayer that will put that crop sensing technology to work for you. Now, not to oversell it, it does one thing and it does it very well. It changes how much liquid comes out of the sprayer in relation to how much canopy it's aimed at. It doesn't do anything with air. So the operator is still required to make that first step of adjusting the air to match the crop. And then, and this is a particular interest to nursery, the sprayer should handle a lot of the rest. So as you move from one canopy shape or density or distance or alley width to the next, instead of rebuilding the entire sprayer each time, which I know a lot of we, we, we just can't do, this, this should make a lot of the decisions for us. Two have recently been sold, uh, I won't name the nursery or the uh, orchard yet because I'm not sure if I can, but it's not far from me in Simcoe and I'm gonna mask up and go unbox these things like an eight year old at Christmas and help install them on a couple of sprayers and see how they work. And if they work well, uh, I'll make sure everybody hears about it. Great, thank you. There's a question for Kara. Is there any research on the cleaning stage, whether soap is better or to use a stronger cleaning agent like Strip It? So um, there, you know, there has been some research on specific pathogens. So I live in a world where we have some pretty serious plant viruses. <laughs> so we tend to focus on some of those and, um, and also some, some, you know, highly contagious bacterial diseases too. So um, there were some studies done that compared, you know, the, the pre-washing detergents kind of thing. Um, a bunch of different ones. Strip it was very effective and I think has some additional things to offer like breaking up salt deposits and things like that too. Um, but there was also some other soaps that were very effective like Dawn dish soap. So I think, you know, in a sense it's some, some soap or some detergent is better than nothing. Um, but of course, you know, you have to consider the surfaces that you're applying them to as well and corrosion and things like that and how well you can rinse them after um, because you know products like strip it can be corrosive if they're not um, managed you know and, and rinsed properly after as well but but there's many many options that can be affected right and that's the concern was was the toxicity to the user and all that ppe so uh, Jason, does the book cover herbicide spraying? Yes and no. It's an air blast book for air blast sprayers, and please don't anybody ever put a herbicide in an air blast sprayer. Uh, I'll find you. But it does talk about nozzle selection and how to read nozzle tables, and it does ultimately talk about how droplets behave. So with a herbicide, we want to use a larger droplet because we don't want it to drift. We want it to stay on target. If we're after a grassy weed, we can go a little smaller. Um, and a lot of those principles of droplet behavior can be applied. But if I had my preference, I would just send you to Sprayers 101 and you type the word herbicide in and uh, prepare to get rock back on your heels by five or six or 10 articles that'll pop up on the subject. So I, I prefer to steer you that way. And Jason, uh, there's a, a grower here. What would I, what should I look for at a system um, for a nozzle to spray beneficial microbes, need them alive. This, uh, I'm going to show my ignorance, Jen. This wouldn't include things like the nematodes, would it? This is more um, fungal. It would probably be more fungal and microbial. Okay. I'm guessing. Well, um, that's less of a question about nozzles and more of a question about filtration. So as far as the nozzles are concerned, if you can keep them in suspension, it shouldn't be any different than spraying a wettable powder. 
your primary concern, I think, would be agitation, keeping everything suspended correctly, for which you need a pump that's at least 15, 20% beyond the capacity that you intend to spray. So stated differently, if your nozzles are going full tilt, your pump doesn't have enough capacity to roll a certain portion back to the tank and keep everything stirred up. Uh, it's a common problem with smaller applications. There's no paddles. You're reliant entirely on that recirculation. If you put strainers in the nozzles, I think you'll be disappointed. You're, you're going to gum them right up. It would be better, I think, to have, say, a 50 mesh uh, strainer long before the boom or however many nozzles you're using. And that way, instead of filtering, say, multiple nozzles, you have a single place to, to keep clean. Um, other than that, things like shear or the, the activity of the pump on microbes, uh, I haven't seen any evidence that that'll destroy them. I would be very cognizant about the nature of the carrier that you're using, your water. I pay very particular attention to its pH, its turbidity. You are suspending something that is alive in a liquid. And if you've ever tried to keep a goldfish alive, you recognize how quickly that can go sideways. Yeah. Bicarbonates, the mineral deposits, the dissolved minerals that are in that water, they all affect that. Jason, one more question. How do you feel about aerial spraying? <laughs> That's a subjective question. Um, gosh, aerial spraying in itself, either fixed wing or rotary, that's helicopters, works. Of course it works. If it didn't work, these people would be out of business. But there are certain limitations to when you take a sprayer and put it in the air. It's going to weigh a lot and you don't want to refill all the time. So by its very nature, you're going to end up with a lower water volume and a more concentrated product. That can work as long as everything's formulated to handle that. But we have to be aware that those droplets have no energy. Um, that is to say, the only thing that's going to make them settle is gravity to a very small extent and whatever other force acts on them, wind, thermals, etc. So it's a bit of a crap shot and uh, a lot of it drift before it gets where it's going. Now, again, I'm not trying to give the aerial industry a black eye. It works and it works well. But I think if I had my preference and if productivity allowed, I would still prefer a ground application just for your ability to tailor what you need to do to each individual crop and each individual condition. So if you get into a bad situation and you run out of time and a ground rig doesn't make sense, by all means, consider aerial, uh, but it would be my second choice. Okay. Thank you all so much. I'm going to leave the, this live for a few minutes in case anybody wants to tool back through the chat section. Um, thank you all very much. We'll, we'll finish the session now. Um, I'll ask you to, to all log out and then you can log out to session, log into session room three for that link. Uh, we'll be starting at 1230. I hope uh, you've got your lunchbox with you because there's not much time. <laughs> but anyways, we'll we'll get you through the day and you'll be out nice and early this afternoon. So lots of great talks coming. Thanks, everyone. See you in the next session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks.